Thank you for tuning in to the Helium Radio Network. You were listening to a rebroadcast of a previously recorded show. Sarah with Dr. Sarah. I'm here with another doctor, Dr. Doris Day. She's a dermatologist and just like, is just so fabulous. And we have so much to talk about in the skincare world. How are you today? I'm so good. So good to be on with you. Yeah. I'm excited to have you because, you know, a lot of my listeners are like women, like in their mid thirties and stuff. And there's just so many skin conditions going on for us. I feel like now, right. Especially oh, yeah. now we're taking the mask off. Well, you know, it's, there's, there's, um, you know, how there's people who are amputees who have sort of uh, referred pain, like uh, imagined limb syndrome, where they yeah. have pain in a limb they don't have. I feel like we have that now because of Zoom, where we have this imagined, I don't look good syndrome, because yeah. we see these faces on Zoom all day long. Mm -hmm. And we Zoom makes you look different. Like I'm sitting here kind of messing with my hair, looking at me. Like if I look at me, I look like I'm looking down, but I'm trying to look at the camera, not at myself, but we stare at ourselves all day, which right. is bad enough. But on top of it, the angle of the camera and the lighting distorts your face. So it yeah. can make your nose seem bigger, your lips seem smaller, and it makes people come in and ask for things that they don't need because it's not really what they look like. And yeah. it makes it, it really does affect our self-esteem. Yeah. It's even worse if you look, think you look better on Zoom because you don't really look like that. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, I hope you don't like that Zoom look because it's not how we really look. Well, I feel that way too. Like I've been on Zoom so much since the pandemic started, but I've always just like noticed more things on me since. Like yeah. I noticed like I've always like, for me, and I'm sure other girls in the 30s have this issue. It's like, my smile lines are turning into sag lines <laughs> in your 30s you know what i know i you know i can my 30s are a vague distant memory but i would say oh my god um, shut up you look fabulous look, <laughs> if you, when they watch us on video they're gonna be like yeah right okay <laughs> <laughs> well it it is one of those things where what i've learned that's interesting that speaks to what you're saying is it's normal to look at yourself and look for things that don't look right, whether it's that your brows may be dropping or you're forming a line or there's a wrinkle or signs of skin aging, because we're kind of hardwired into our DNA to look for danger and signs of trouble. So we tend to overlook what's beautiful about ourselves. And we tend to see the things that are signs of degradation or aging, which that kind of crudely is. Um, but the thing is, is that we're smarter than that. So we can overcome it and say, yeah, you know what, as we age, things do change. The skeleton mm -hmm. shrinks a little bit, the skin expands a little bit, and we're going to, we're going to have a different balance and proportion, but that doesn't make you less beautiful. You can be as or more beautiful as you age. And my new tagline is older is better. And my other new tagline is age backwards. So you can do both. You can say older is better in terms of your age. As you get older, you should become more fulfilled, more accomplished, more satisfied with your life, more accepting of things. But you can also age backwards if you do very easy things like sun protection every day, mm -hmm. things like a better diet. And as we get older and wiser, we know that sun is very harmful for your skin. And 90% of how your skin ages is based on lifestyle. UV okay. is the majority of that, smoking, stress, poor diet, lack of sleep, all yeah. of those things are what contribute to your age. Your genes do very little when it comes to your skin aging. Interesting. So um, basically when I was frying myself at 16, I kind of screwed myself over. <laughs> well, but you know what? It's never too late to start. So that was unfortunate. And yeah. a lot of times we, and I wish I could say that that was a thing of the past, right? but 16 year olds are still going to tanning salons and using the are baby they? oil and iodine and reflectors, even though we know better now. I mean, a lot of people yeah. can say, if only I knew now what I knew then, but now we know, and they're still doing it. So, um, mm -hmm. and, and the problem is that a lot of times that it's the mom that takes their daughters, their teenage daughters to the tanning salon. 
So as an organization, the American uh, Academy of Dermatology, the American Society of Dermatologic Surgery, the Skin Cancer Foundation, the American Skin Association, yeah. we're all working together to try to ban teens from going to tanning salons. But oversight of that is really tough. I mean, who's going to really ask the questions or punish the places that let the teens get the tan? And indoor tanning can be 10 times more damaging and stronger than going just out in the sun. So none of it's good. All wavelengths of UV radiation, whether it's UVA or UVB, UVC is blocked by the ozone layer, but all wavelengths of UV light that reach the earth are harmful to your skin. And the World Health Organization has called them known carcinogens, meaning anyone exposed to enough of them will ultimately develop skin cancer besides premature aging and wrinkles and blotchiness. Yeah, that's really interesting because like, our, um, like when I went to high school like in the 90s, mid 90s, right? Everybody went to tanning salons, even myself. And like, I'm just like, I wish, I just remember being like 16 going, when I'm 40, it won't matter. And then <laughs> you get there and you're like, oh, oh God, what did I do to myself? But I can't believe that's very interesting to me that kids still go. I didn't even know they kind of still existed. They Especially do. Spray tanning, spray tanning is so much better. Spray tanning is so much better. Yeah. And recently there was a report about benzene and sunscreens. And this made the news because benzene is also a known carcinogen, just like UV rays. And this company called Valashore did a study of about 200 or so sunscreens from a bunch of different companies and found that 78 of them had greater than FDA allowed uh, or wow. recommended amounts of this ingredient benzene. Wow. which can cause blood cancers. So benzene, for your listeners and viewers, is a known carcinogen. It's found in just about everything. So if you burn a candle, if you burn wood or have a barbecue, if you breathe pollution, it's in car exhaust. When they extract the seeds from nuts, they use benzene. Like it's it's part of pretty much everything. So you everything. eat it unwittingly, you're exposed to it unwittingly, and it may be in your sunscreen unwittingly. So it's not added in. It's, you won't see it on the label because it's not an ingredient that's meant to be there. Um, right. And how it ended up there in some of these sunscreens is, is to be examined. But it is one of the thing about it in sunscreens that should make you feel better is it was only in the spray sunscreens. So if you really have a concern, don't use a spray sunscreen, use the cream or the lotion or the powders. Mm -hmm. The other thing is that benzene is volatile, meaning it evaporates quickly. So right. in order to reach the levels that this company said that you had in the blood, you'd have to spray the entire body, which nobody mm -hmm. does. Um, right. Nobody <laughs> uses that much. And secondly, yeah. it evaporates off the skin. So what they found in the product isn't what would end up penetrating and affecting you in your bloodstream because it would evaporate okay. off a good amount of it, actually probably most of it before it ended up entering your bloodstream. So um, it, so if you're worried about aging and cancer and hurting mm -hmm. your skin, don't be afraid of sunscreen, be yeah. afraid of too much sun. And let's be clear, I'm an outdoor person. I think yeah. everybody should spend as much time outdoors as possible. It's mm -hmm. good for you. It's healthy. And sunlight is amazing. It's my favorite thing. But doesn't mean that you have to go out and fry. You can go right. out but be sun smart. And sunscreen is only one component of being sun smart. You have to ideally wear a hat, wear sunglasses, mm -hmm. wear sun protective clothing, stay in the shade when you can, and try to avoid midday sun. So all of those things together will help you age beautifully. And even more important than putting sunscreen on your face, do you know where it is, where I would say to apply it? Chest. I'm just quizzing you on the spot. What, what did you chest? say? The chest. neck. Neck and neck. chest. Okay, yes. I was close. <laughs> you were right. You were, yeah, you were right there. So it's your neck. So it's the bottom of the neck. Nobody likes their neck when they hit 50s and 60s. Yeah. No. But if you start today and you put sunscreen at the base of your neck and the sides of your neck, because your chin creates a shadow that protects right underneath. So I often see a white okay. circle or a lighter colored circle from the shadow of the chin. And then you can see the damage that goes right, under right where that shadow wears off. So the neck ages more poorly and quicker and yeah. it heals much more slowly. And it's so much harder to fix than the face. So you wanna preserve your collagen because a few things happen as you age. 
you have the collagen breakdown from sun and we know exactly what that process is. It's not a mystery what happens. We know mm -hmm. that UV exposure creates these, um, something called matrix metalloproteinases that break down collagen. Okay. As you get older, you rebuild it less. As you get older and you have less estrogen, you rebuild less collagen. So now you're at a net loss and you're right. taking thin areas of your skin, like the neck and around the eyes, and you've done this damage and now they really aren't going to repair. And even if you did a neck lift or tightening, I see everybody coming back at a year later going, I just wanted this much more because that area, if the skin quality isn't good, you could pull it as tight as you want, but it's still not going to look good. You'll look right. more skeletonized, but you won't look younger or really better. So protecting your neck skin and not getting the damage is so much more rewarding and powerful. Look at Meryl Streep's neck. It's just beautiful. Look at um, Diane Sawyer's neck. These are women who've done really smart sun protection behaviors over their lifetimes, and mm -hmm. they're rewarded in their 60s and maybe 70s, I don't know how old they are, with yeah. beautiful skin because- uh -huh. They tried not to damage it from the beginning. So I always say, go with your own glow and celebrate your natural skin tone. Try to preserve it. And then as you age, it'll look really good. Because in reality, when you're in your 20s and 30s, you're mm -hmm. at your peak of beauty, like your natural beauty in terms of youth and what, you know. You feel, your face is in. nice and full. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, so you're squandering your beauties of your 60s by trying to get a tan or doing these other things in your 20s and 30s. So you'll be 3% more beautiful in that year and 30% less beautiful as you get older. So if you mm -hmm. kind of think of the risk versus benefit, the, the benefit of a little bit of, you know, a lot of sun now for a little bit of a tan or, you know, a tan and a little right. bit more beauty now it's going to cost you so much later in ways that we really can't reverse. We can try to improve it, but we right. can't take it away like it never happened. I mean, this is like, so such good advice, especially for the young kids, because like, yeah. I'm just starting to notice exactly what you're saying. Like, yeah. like the more I was out golfing, I just had that natural tendency to tan, but like, I would always notice, I'm like, wait, I forgot to put something on my neck or even like the tips of your ears. I have like, yeah people forget about that stuff. Yeah. And the top of their nose, they forget. So, you know, <laughs> every summer I have the same kind of, I just laugh because I can't, what else can I do? But patients coming in with like full on tans and burns and I'm like, <laughs> and they're like, no, I wore sunscreen. I swear. I just absorbed the rays. Like everyone just magically is like an absorber. Of, when you said that, you reminded me of this. And it just cracks me up so much when people come in and go, no, my skin just absorbs the sun. I, I, I do all these things. And I'm like, uh -huh. okay, well, then you need to wear sun protective clothing. Because because you have to understand, a tan is a burn. A okay. tan, when you, when you tan, it's because UVA rays and B rays, both UVA and UVB have reached your skin cells and created damage, which mm -hmm. stimulates the melanocytes, the pigment forming cells that make a tan to wake up, to make pigment, to try to shield those skin cells yep. from the UV damage. So you don't make that melanin unless you're exposed to danger. Right. That's so and true. Then, I, I, do, I do know this, that, but I always like, yeah, everybody likes their tan, right? You know? <laughs> you know, I don't actually, I like my skin better, not tan. So I'm very lucky. I hate my, the color of my skin when it's tan. It, to me, it's like a greenish color. So either I convinced myself of this or my dad convinced me at a young age, but I, I've never thought of tan. Well, you look fabulous. So, you know, <laughs> you're talking about like, you know, oh, and it's me. funny that you say that about the tan too, because, okay, my mother is so Irish, but they moved to Florida and I had, you know, with the pandemic. It should be a I, law. Oh, so, but she, you know, and she always wears sun protective clothing, never has a tan. And I look at her and I'm like, your legs are tan. She goes, I know, I can't believe it. She goes, I never realized like when I'm in the water in the pool yeah. or the and especially it goes through water. Already, yeah, she's had things taken off that were close to a cancer, but got caught really early. And she's like, Super. my dermatologist is going to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's interesting. It can go through three feet of water. Yeah, yeah. I didn't even know that until she yeah. said that. And then we have these people that are like way too tan at their pool. And they're like, yeah, yeah we get tan by sitting here all day. I'm like, but you Ugh. look terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's, it's true. It's And it is kind of addictive because we know that that exposure does release endorphins. So it yeah. does become a little bit of an addiction, but you can 
get those endorphins from exercise and other things. So you don't need to get a tan to do that. Yeah, I know. Well, I mean, cause like, especially going into summer now you have your own skincare line. Do you have a sunscreen in it? I do. I have three okay. different sunscreens. So, um, it's, I, mine are all mineral based sunscreens, but okay. I added different antioxidants and hydrators. So I have my facial silk, which is a mixture of zinc and titanium. And then I have the hydrate facial silk, which I added in some extra okay. antioxidants. And then I have my vitamin E essential, which is a vitamin E sunscreen that's um, zinc and titanium based. So one is zinc and titanium, two are zinc and titanium, one is pure zinc. Oh, okay. And, oh, well, and, tell, um, tell everybody. And it has a tint so to it. Important. Sorry. And well, tell me what, what should I say? The mineral, um, people don't understand oh, yeah. the difference between that. So yes. I just would love to hear it just so they know. Totally. One of the things I love to talk about, the difference between mineral and absorbed sunscreens. Mm -hmm. One thing to understand is that everything is a chemical. So it's not physical and chemical because they're all chemicals. We're all chemicals. Everything is chemicals. So there's no avoiding chemicals um, because it's all that's all there is is chemicals. But in sunscreens, there's two basic types. One is absorbed, which are the avobenzones, which now are kind of getting a bad name because of the mm -hmm. coral reefs. And I'm not sure how much truth there is to that, there may or may not be, but at the same time, we have other options. The reason why the absorbed sunscreens are nice is because they're absorbed and so they're invisible. Mm -hmm. They You apply to the skin, they get absorbed into the skin and then they act like your melanin basically, they absorb the UV rays and protect your skin from the damage. So they're more cosmetically elegant. And especially if you have skin of color, mm -hmm. and you don't want that sunscreen to show on your skin, yeah. absorbed sunscreens are really nice. But again, there's issues of coral reef. There's now some issues about the absorption itself being problematic. And the FDA has approved these. So uh, sunscreen ingredients in the US are approved as drugs. In Europe, sunscreen ingredients are cosmetic. So they don't have to go through that approval process. Wow. And the reason why we have so few ingredients in this country is because that approval process is very rigorous and very expensive. And a lot mm -hmm. of companies that have sunscreens in Europe don't have the safety data to get the approval in the US. But even once the FDA approves a sunscreen ingredient, they don't stop asking questions. So yeah. even after a product is available on the market, if questions come up, the FDA will ask the companies for more information. And that's what's happened with avobenzone. They haven't said it's not safe. What they've said is we want more information about absorption and potential 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 issues so there's okay. there's no issues that we know of but the fda is just asking for more information now that these ingredients have been available for so long now what was it about the coral reef i didn't know about this well the question was is it destroying the coral reefs and the is it because it's, it's coming off of people yeah because people put it on okay. and they go in the sun or they take showers and it ends up in the water that ends up okay. in the ocean Mm -hmm. um, and so this was a concern and right. you can kind of find data on both sides. Everything depends on how you look at it. And it's how many parts per million of these ingredients end up at the coral reefs. Is it really a high enough concentration to be a problem? And if it's any risk at all, should we just take it off the market because our coral reefs yeah. are precious? So right. I'm a huge nature lover and animal yeah. lover and just life lover. So I would never want anything that hurts anything. But at the same time, a lot of the companies that say these things talk about the dangers of sunscreen. They also have an agenda. So there's no pure side to this, right? Okay. Everybody has a side and an Something. angle. So you kind of have to take everything with a grain of salt and sort of look for data on things. And I think that data is it still has to be accumulated. So I, I don't know for sure if it's an issue or not, but mm -hmm. it, places like Hawaii, they banned it. Oh, so wow. they're not even okay. waiting for all the data. They're just saying, no, you can't use that sunscreen here. And um, and that it may make Ava Benzo go away, but we're going to have a lot fewer sunscreens available. So that's the absorbed sunscreens. Then there is the physical sunscreens, and they're called physical because they don't get absorbed into the skin. They physically sit on the skin. And okay. those are the mineral-based sunscreens, the zinc oxide and titanium dioxide. So mm -hmm. in their natural color, they're white. And even on yeah. white people, it's white. It's and, hard to get in sometimes. <laughs> yeah, and it's hard to get in and it, and it looks like you're wearing something. So you might as well be wearing clothing. It's kind of like painting on clothing onto your yeah. skin. 
Now they've come a long way where we've been able to add tonin. My facial silk actually has melanin in it, which helps it match your natural skin tone. So okay. we try to make it more cosmetically elegant. And when you use a mineral sunscreen, you should probably use a little bit more and then warm it up between your fingers. So you kind of help it blend in and then yeah. put it on the face. Right. When you put sunscreen on, my, my recommendation is to start at the hairline and do the periphery of the face and in front of the ears, because a lot of places where I see sun damage is along the hairline and in front of mm -hmm. the ears, brown spots and sun damage. Then go down the side of the neck, the bottom of the neck, and then up the middle. So you'll do that on both sides of the face. So if you get the periphery, the sides, the bottom, and then move back up. And then what I do is I reapply it. So I put it on once, wait a few minutes, and then I do another mm -hmm. layer because the SPF on the label is based on laboratory testing so that they have uniformity of getting that number, not real world use. And okay. in the real world, nobody uses the right amount to get that actual SPF. So if you okay. apply it and then reapply it, chances are you get closer to that SPF on the label. And my new line of the day, I just said this to a patient and I had my staff write it down, they email it to me, but my new line is that if you don't reapply it, you didn't apply it. <laughs> because everybody comes in and they say, oh, but I use sunscreen. And I'm like, okay, first thing in the morning, you use sunscreen. Yeah, yeah. And I said, then you were out all day. Uh-huh. And, 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 <laughs> and I'm like, well, you had to reapply it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, I didn't reapply it very much. So <laughs> if you didn't reapply it, you didn't apply it because it's gone by 11. You've either worn it off or it's, or it's what? degraded. Yeah. And so you're left now at the most intense UV time of the day, which is the middle of the day, without mm -hmm. any protection and this false sense of security. So in those patients, I almost prefer they don't even bother wearing sunscreen because then they might go in the shade or go inside, but they put it on in the morning. So like, oh, no, I use my sunscreen. So therefore no sun counts because I use my sunscreen. So if you get a tan, no matter what you did, the tan still counts. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what else to say. Try not to tan. It's like, I'll say 5,000 different ways and hope that it resonates. Um, I mean, guys, if you're just listening on the podcast, we do do video, but if you see Dr. Day, her skin is full flawless. Oh, <laughs> it really is. It's just beautiful. Like, I'm just looking at your glow and I'm like... Thanks. We need to, we need to buy what you're selling. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm serious about skincare. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you've been doing this so long, like what, 20 years now? 20 years, but I also um, started out working in a research lab. So I've worked on oh. ingredients, looking at how they affect um, keratinocytes, which are your skin cells. So I've been looking at this through a microscope and through different types of testing for a very long time. I, I worked in a research lab at NYU um, as part of, you know, in between training. So I did, actually, I did journalism and then studied literature and philosophy and then was a medical reporter. So I have an investigational side to me. I'm and sweet. then I did medicine and then dermatology and research in the middle. So I've, I, I kind of look at the skin, but I also look through the skin a lot mm -hmm. of times when I see my patients and I'm always looking for trouble, looking for what else could be going on. So if I see um, something in the skin, I'm thinking, is there, what are signs of diabetes? What are signs of asthma, oh. allergies, heart disease, liver disease, kidney disease, depression, all of those things can show in the skin. I'm always thinking, wow, how do I help this patient not just look better, but actually be better. And I think that's what separates out a physician and a healer from a technician. So I could easily just do stuff or prescribe stuff, but that's not what I think is really helpful. I think what helps people live better lives is trying to hear them and understand what's motivating them to come in today and show me what they show me and tell me what they tell me. And based on that, what I can do for them that will make them need less medicine or need the medicine for less long so they can get back to their life. Because in the end, I feel like we're, we're so big on just prescribing things. Yeah. And my, I started to think that we're one day just all going to die of a side effect, that we're going to just keep taking meds, have a side effect from the med, take a med for the side effect of that med. And then ultimately something is going to get us from the meds. I <laughs> so know. I want as few in the way of little in the way of drugs as possible. And as much in the way of your own internal power over your own health and well-being. I know. And it's so true because I have my degree in pharmacy. So I know about all those side effects and the yeah. things that 
these right. drugs can do to you. And it's kind of like a crazy, yeah. mm, I'm just like, no, I love how you like look at the whole picture because, you know, there's like hormone imbalances, like the diabetes, you said that, like there's so many things going on that people don't even realize sometimes. Right. You know? And you know, there's no shortcuts that a lot of this stuff, when you get into those good habits of eating better, allowing yourself to sleep, tapping into your own power and your own energy, you'll see then it, then it gets easier. But to cross over and to not rely on medicines, we, we teach people to rely on medicines. We go, oh, there's a pill for that. Like half the commercials on TV are, you have a headache, take a medicine. You have migraines, yeah. take a medicine. All these yeah. things. But in reality, there's there's reasons behind this and if you can sort out those reasons whether as you mentioned it's a hormonal imbalance or mm -hmm. if it's a nutritional um, adjustment that you can make better hydration all of those things can have a really powerful impact and just moving just exercising walking around your house jumping up and down listening to happy music singing yeah. I mean, for me, it'd be singing when no one else is listening. Because yeah, that would same. Scare people away. <laughs> I mean, Doris Day would just show up out of her grave and go, can I have my name back? <laughs> but, you know, whatever yeah. makes you happy. I know. But what would you say, like, what is one of the number one treatments people come in looking for? Um, well, you know, they can come in. So they come in asking about lines and wrinkles mm -hmm. so wrinkles and discoloration those are the two main things mm -hmm. so the the line in the 40s is one day my face just fell apart and that drives people crazy they just wake up one day and they go hey, what happened what happened <laughs> i know and I, uh, i'm blaming it on the mask i swear to god i didn't have like <laughs> smile lines or i i must have frowned a lot in the last year at people because now i got those lines <laughs> yes. So there's good exercises you can do. Now I'm looking at you, so I can't tell if it looks like I'm looking over to the side, but I'm looking at your beautiful face and you are radiant, absolutely radiant. It's so. a light, it's a light. <laughs> good lighting, whatever that lighting. So that's what I decided is I don't need makeup or anything. I just need that guy with the good diffuser light filter just follow me around all day. I know. <laughs> and just take away all shadows. I know. <laughs> but uh, sadly they don't exist. I so know. The, the reality is, is that all of those things are addressable. And okay. the thing that people have to understand is that you're not aging in one dimension. So it's not going to be just Botox or just filler or just a device. It's often a combination of things. It's always sun protection, skincare, better diet, better sleep, all those things that you have control over at home. And right. then in the office, it's often combining the neuromodulators like the Botox, Dysport, Xeomin, or Javeau, because there's now a whole bunch of different of those okay. Botox equivalents, we call them. Um, even though they're all different. So your doctor will pick the right one for you. Mm -hmm. And then fillers very carefully, very appropriately placed so that you look like you. It should be subtly dramatic, not mm -hmm. different. Um, right. And then devices. We have radio frequency devices. We have ultrasound devices, lasers that can help stimulate collagen and tighten. And it's often a combination of these. And now because of the advanced technology, we can work on neck, chest, arms, abdomens, contouring for the body, thighs. There's so much we can do. And right. now we have new treatments for cellulite. Quo just became FDA approved that can help cellulite. So there's a lot that we can do. You're, you're speaking my love body. language here. Because <laughs> <laughs> you just said, okay, that's another thing with the hormonal imbalance in that age group too. Tell me more, like, do you think cool sculpting's worth it? Is the, um, what's it, the um, cool toning? Like, yeah. are those worth the, the treatment? Like, will they get rid of stubborn fat? They can. And I don't do either of those in my office, but okay. the cool sculpting elite seems to be better than cool sculpting. And that uses cold technology to basically freeze melt fat. Okay. It is very technician dependent. So you, I would make sure you're seeing somebody who's good at it. And mm -hmm. I, I really prefer things being done from a doctor's office as opposed to a spa. Right. So mm -hmm. that's one thing I feel really strongly about that you want a doctor to evaluate you, tell you if you're a good candidate. And these are really good for problem stubborn areas, but not for weight loss. So if it's just that like, you know, you gained weight and you just don't feel like dieting, you just want to lose the weight, then yeah. no. But if you mm -hmm. have an area that no matter how much you exercise, this area just doesn't go away. Right. Like some people get the saddlebag, some people get the stomach fat, then that can be helpful. Um, I use the Fatona laser for helping for body contouring. We love that in my office. So that's what I do. 
but there's lots of things that you can do that your doctor can help determine one, if you're a good candidate or, and two, what it would be for you to do it. I personally still think, and I tell most of my patients that for most people, the gold standard is still liposuction. And I don't do liposuction. I'm trained in it, but I just don't have the time. Yeah. So you want a, a plastic surgeon or dermatologist and dermatologists really finessed the techniques for liposuction. So I personally think that dermatologists are the best go-to people for mm -hmm. liposuction. And we do it with something called tumescent anesthesia, which is all local anesthesia. And no, you don't need to be knocked out. You, you can be wide awake for it, which I think is much, much safer. But if you're absolutely against doing that, then you can do things like either Cool Sculpting Elite or Cool Tone or the Fatona. I also do Vanquish in my office, which uses multipolar radio frequency. And you'll find over and unders for all of these. You'll find they all have potential side effects depending yeah. on the device. They can all work more or less well for one person and not another. And okay. there's a lot of variation around this. So it's just, you know, I'm trying to find the best doctor for you and understanding your options and knowing that even if everything is done right, you may not get the results that you want. That's so crazy. Like I see, I'm too afraid of surgery. So <laughs> I know I would totally do the liposuction. So that's what I tell my patients. I would do liposuction. You would do it. Oh, if I needed it. Oh yeah. No, I, I, I barely think of liposuction as surgery. Like it's local anesthesia and then a little cannula that goes in and just sucks out and contours the fat and it's precise and it's reliable and you can see the fat being sucked out. So, and then afterwards you can wear something to contour. Yeah, um, that's where I would go. And I'm not a big, you know, I, I don't love surgery. So I, you know, I'm, I would get old before I do a facelift, I think. Yeah. I mean, maybe right. I won't think that way in a couple of years from now, but for <laughs> now I feel that way. But I see my patients after facelifts and I work with plastic surgeons all the time who do beautiful work. And, um, and I send them patients for, for facelifts because my first question to my patients is, would you have a facelift? And for right. patients who say, yeah, I would have a facelift. Then I send them to a plastic surgeon because I don't do facelifts. I don't mimic facelifts. I don't expect the treatments I do to look like a facelift. Only a facelift looks like a facelift. So if okay. that's what you want, then see a plastic surgeon and it's okay. But what I do is I help restore balance and harmony and, um, and add volume. Now, one thing to understand is that when you do something like a facelift, especially if you're thin, you'll have, you'll get rid of some of the excess skin, you'll redrape and you'll look smoother. But I see many people after facelifts who don't necessarily look younger. And you mm. have to kind of ask yourself if what your goal is. And if it's really to look younger, sometimes you need more volume. And I have those patients come back after the facelift. And then I do the fillers to restore volume. So now mm -hmm. they have contours and they have volume and that helps them look more, both more beautiful and younger. And there's a difference between looking more beautiful and looking younger. If you have beautiful cheekbones that are contoured, you look more beautiful, but not necessarily younger. But if you lose volume in the chin and, you're, and you start to sink in, it makes you look like you don't have teeth, like you sink in there. When mm -hmm. I restore the chin area, people look younger. And understanding the differences and what we're trying to accomplish with these is really important before you do a treatment. And you have to know for yourself what your goals are. And my hope is always that people say more beautiful rather than younger, because mm -hmm. I don't necessarily think that, well, younger is often not possible. If you're 50, you're not going to look 20 because the structural change is different. And yeah. the skin quality is different. Even if you've been good about the sun, we just change our hormones change, things change, but you can have the beautiful balance and proportion. And then what you have at 50 that you don't have at 20 is a life. You've right. lived those 30 years and you have accomplished and you've suffered and you've experienced and you've maybe had kids and careers and travel right. and all those things add beauty in a way that no filler could ever recreate or erase and that's true I, I i i would be all about hey just make me just like look like myself still <laughs> exactly <laughs> kind of right? the biggest compliment out, you know yeah it's so true i gotta tell you i gotta get rid of these smile lines <laughs> <laughs> you don't have smile lines. You're I so do, funny. I swear. 
I'm going to come visit you and you'll be like, oh, yeah, you'll be like, no, nah. maybe without that filter, it would look different. But right now you look pretty perfect. <laughs> Thanks. So, and I'm, I'm purposely not looking at me. I'm looking at the camera. So <laughs> I know I, so I have no I'm idea what like, I look I'm like. trying not to look at myself. So I was trying to look down. I know. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I, I look at myself in the mirror of my mind's eye. So what I think you're seeing or anybody who looks at me is seeing is like me with perfect makeup, perfect hair, and uh -huh. they see Raquel Welsh, because that's what I see in the mirror. Yeah, of my actually, <laughs> actually, you kind of do look like her. Uh, but like well, a, a nice I'm channeling her. <laughs> so yeah, so I have my my three characters that I kind of channel. One is my uh -huh. Raquel Welsh. So when I look, when I close my eyes and I look at myself in the mirror of my mind's eye, it's Raquel Welsh in that poster of when she was like the Amazon girl. It was like so gorgeous, <laughs> like that big, beautiful poster picture yeah. of her. Yep. And then the second is when I am at an event or when I'm presenting, it's Grace Kelly, because she had that beautiful poise and yeah. this calm beauty. And when I'm doing my injections or taking care of patients that I'm, I really need to be on, um, mm -hmm. I'm Beyonce, because <laughs> <laughs> I see her walking down the aisle of this Here I come. stadium. <laughs> and she is wearing this beautiful outfit, not a leotard, so I'm not into that, but the skirt. And yeah. she gets up on stage and the wind is blowing and her hair is just, <laughs> just so, and she picks up that mic and she just nails every note. And I'm like, that's what I got to do. You that's know, I've good. got this patient in front of me. For them, it's 100%. And I can't have an off day. I've got to be 150% or 1,000% for them. Right. And so I bring on my Beyonce. I love it. I love it. It's always good to know that your doctors are on 100%, right? <laughs> it's got to be. Yeah. Um, well, where can everybody like reach out and like buy your skincare line? Because obviously they need it because look at your face. Hello. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so I'm really easy to find on like all the social media. My website is Dr. Doris Day. So I'm at Dr. Doris Day on mm -hmm. Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok. Now I started doing a couple of TikTok. Oh, are you TikToking? Yes. I'm TikToking. I'm a newbie. So I'm it's not a learning curve. Me too. Same. I think yeah. I have like 600 people who follow me and I'm like, I don't know <laughs> what's going to take, but you will, you'll take I off have 60. Have okay. <laughs> I'm like really new. Like I'm three days into this, but I'm, I'm, oh, okay. I'm working on it. <laughs> it's really kind of fun. It's, it's a whole new creative outlet. It this TikTok that it can do a lot. And I'm learning from watching other people's TikToks. Mm -hmm. I I'm just fascinated. There's so much on there. So yeah, it took me a long time to get to it because I've like, I've got enough to do, but I'm having <laughs> fun with it. <laughs> Just a few. Yeah. It's important. And you can reach a lot of people. You know, my goal is for dermatologists to be the influencers of skincare and beauty, because mm -hmm. we study this and we can cut to the chase with what's good for you and what you need to watch out for. And I have patients who come in every day with bags of products and they are using all the wrong things for their skin, but they're kind of buying the label. It says hope in a jar all day long, which is actually a great product from philosophy. So not that it's that product, but right. no, the but... idea of that. Right. And, um, and unfortunately they're using the wrong things for their skin. I'm writing, you know, I have a book out called Beyond Beautiful and I'm working on my next one, which is on the skin microbiome. And I'm writing that one with a PhD. So I'm always looking to, grow both my own understanding and share with everyone else in a way that they can understand and relate to how to have beautiful skin. And it doesn't always have to be a 10 step routine. It could be two or three steps, cool. but one of those steps has to be being sun smart. Back yeah. to that. <laughs> it comes all the way back to that sunscreen in the end yes. where we started, right? <laughs> Correct. Exactly. That's really incredible. I'm like always obsessed with people who can write books because like I, I've talked about it a couple of times here. I'm trying to get a children's book out. So I'm always like mystified, like how that all process. That's going to be my new thing for this year is to figure it's it hard. out. It's hard. I'm trying to figure out how not to write a book. I keep saying, okay, I'm not going to write any more books. And then I'm like, oh, but I got to write this. But I have <laughs> another idea, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you're so smart. You just know everything. I love it. <laughs> oh, thank you. You too. Right. I'm having fun. Oh, yeah. We got to do this again. I have so many questions, but I was like, I have to talk about the cool scalp because so many people, I mean, even I like consider doing it because I just have like, we, I call it the premenopausal middle. It's just a bummer. Yeah, it can be good for that. I still think that liposuction is better, but mm -hmm. it can, but you can try cool sculpting first. The, look for the new elite one. 
And again, yeah. I don't do that one, but I think it's much better than the original. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. And, and see a doctor um, yeah. oh, to make sure you're a good candidate. I always tell people that I'm like, you have, you can't just go to a salon and expect something. You need, you need the truth. They'll tell you like, you know, so you come to New York and see you. I'm going to come to New York. <laughs> I'm excited to meet you in person. Yeah, that'd be fun. Now we can go out and about. So it's great now this year. So I can start traveling again. <laughs> Woohoo. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for stopping by and chatting with us about this was so informative, you guys. So I hope you listen. We have so much sunscreen information here, you know, and how to stay looking as beautiful as Dr. Day. So thank you for joining us. Thank you. And stay in touch. All right. Thanks. This is thank you. With Sarah. We'll see you guys next week. Bye. Have a good day. Bye. I'll talk Thanks. to you soon. Thank you for listening to Helium Radio. The views expressed by show hosts or their guests are their own and should not be construed in any way as advice from Helium Radio. We make no recommendations or endorsements for radio show programs, services, or products mentioned on air or on our website. Personal perspectives expressed by producers, writers, and editors will always be presented as such. Any rebroadcast or retransmission without the express written consent of Helium Radio is strictly prohibited. Thanks for listening.